Green gets the snap, fakes it to Genty. Green gonna run it himself, getting to the corner, diving for the pylon. Is he in or is he out at the one? Touchdown, Taylor Green, eight yard run, Taylor Green. And Boise State scores first. Dubar in motion left to right. Hand off Alani. Flip it back to Green. Green going long. Out there is Austin Bolt. Nobody there. Bolt caught it at the 15 and scores. Touchdown. Green to Bolt. 59 yards at Boise State in business. Mayava back to pass. All day. Mayava down the middle of the field. And it's a jumping interception by Andrew Simpson. He'll intercept it at the Bronco 31, and Boise State gets the ball back on their third forced turnover. Hey, champ. Hey, champ, how you feeling? How you feeling? Get him, get him, get him, get him, get him, get him, get him. Hey, I don't know if it's recording or if it's a picture, but I'm pretty sure Coach D is the first ever intern head coach to win a conference championship. It ain't about me. It ain't about me. It may not be about it, but stop the search. It's over. We did it. I'm overwhelmed just because of how much I love these kids. And when they say those things, it just, I adore them so much. At, at the end of the day, this isn't about me. This is about Boise State, Bronco Nation, these kids. But it, it just, when they bring those things up, I adore these young men. Seven years at Boise State. You came here as a graduate assistant. You have worked your way up from a position coach to a defensive coordinator. Now you're the interim head coach for the second time in your career. How badly do you want to be in Boise moving forward, Spencer? This is my dream job, Judd. This is my dream job because I love these kids. And at the end of the day, I trust the good Lord, whatever happens after that, but that's point blank, end of story. Alexander Tubner and the rest of the Boise State football team made their case, and now Spencer Danielson becomes the 12th head coach in the history of the Boise State football program. Welcome on into Jay's Sports Bar. As always, I'm joined by Shane Williams Rhodes and so much to dissect on the show today. Go on, baby. I don't remember a busier December in the history of the time that I have been covering the Boise State football program. Uh, we will talk about Ashton Genty returning to Boise State, Taylor Green leaving, at least for now. But we begin with Spencer Danielson being named the head coach. We heard it from the players, and that apparently Jeremiah Dickey did as well on Sunday evening he officially names and announces Spencer Danielson as the next head coach of the football program what are your thoughts uh it looks like the kids really really enjoyed it um I mean they've been calling for it for the last you know two or three weeks so it's good to see them get you know what it was they actually wanted uh it looks like it's had a very positive effect on the team because since obviously that's happened uh he's been able to keep you know uh some of that pedigree that we have in that building the biggest one ashton genty number two again i want to talk about him but um you know throughout this whole process even going back to the beginning of the process jeremiah dickey said it was a matter of if not when spencer danielson would become a head football coach at the collegiate level we visited him with we visited with jeremiah a couple of weeks ago on the pregame show and he said the exact same thing so why did when become now Jeremiah explained. Thursday at 12.15. Uh, I was actually meeting with Spencer. And you all know my faith is important to me. And, and I had been praying for a burning bush. And they don't, they don't always show up the way you think it will. And through that moment in the process, I was struggling. I understand the pressure of my position and the role that I have and the responsibility I have. And as Spencer spoke in terms of love as an action and to serve, and that's who I am. And as I was sitting there and I had prayed before I went in to that meeting with him, and we weren't even talking about the search. I mean, he was running the program at this point. So I was, I was asking him questions um, and it was, and he probably doesn't even know this. Um, I was holding back tears because when you go, sorry, I love these guys. I love this team. I love all of our student athletes. I know you see my son here and I have two others at home and my wife, but when you're an AD and a leader, you're responsible for a lot. And I knew that I had an important decision to make that was going to impact not just one individual, but many. And at that moment, everything came together. 
It was the first time that, that I was at peace. I love that Jeremiah Dickey remembered the exact time, the exact moment that his head, heart, and gut aligned and um, that he felt like Spencer Danielson was the right guy for his job for this job. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times we have heard Spencer Danielson say that like he was teetering on the verge of tears throughout this process, hearing from the players, getting this opportunity, all of this stuff. But Jeremiah Dickey was an emotional man throughout this thing too as well, fighting back tears at Spencer Danielson's introductory press conference. The emotion of Dar Jeremiah Dickey is so genuine, it is so real, and I think it is unique for that position, especially here at Boise State. No, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I wanna go back to something though about four or five weeks ago we mm -hmm. were talking about some things and we were saying you know winning kind of kind of solves a lot of problems when you have things going on internally and I think this hire for Jeremiah not only obviously what we said winning kind of you know fixes everything because you have an interim guy and he goes three and oh and you win a conference championship you're going to a bowl game but it was that on top of having those kids support like that you don't usually see, you know, that many guys come out and behind a coach like that. I mean, you even said it. Like, when you guys had an interim head coach, I know you guys loved Bob Gregory. But at the same time, it did not feel like this. It did not feel like we want this guy to stay here and be our leader. And, again, that's that's no offense to him because he's, he's done tremendous things throughout his career. But this was unique to see all these players speak up in front of the athletic director, in front of the president of the school, and say, we want this guy, end the search now. It's just not something that is normal. Like like you said, I mean, when it happened, when Bob was the head coach, we knew that Bob was leaving with Pete. <laughs> so, right. You know, so it's kind of hard to get behind that guy. But, you know, even with everything that's happened with Andy, Spencer has always, you know, kept the main thing the main thing, which is something they always say around there. Mm -hmm. And he kept the focus on the players and on the team and finishing out strong and, you know, just keep right in the ship because it was we were going in the wrong direction. We heard a lot about how this team lacked consistency through the first part of the season. We'd see them play really good. We'd see them play really bad. They would build a 17 point lead and they would blow it. They would overcome a 17 point lead. I mean, these are things that happen to this team. And I think another thing that stands out to me about Spencer Danielson outside of his passion for the for this game, the players, his selflessness. Um, is the fact that he is just tremendously consistent. DJ Schramm, Alexander Tubner, uh, so many guys have repeatedly said, man, the, the guy that we walked into that building and knew on day one is the guy that we know today. He is not, he hasn't changed. He, in terms, I mean, obviously he's grown as a football coach, but in terms of his character, his personality, I think the guys walk into that building and they know what they're getting every single day from Spencer Danielson. They're getting a guy that cares about them going to bring a ton of energy, is passionate, um, wants to run his football program through the action of, of love. And for him, he said that love means you're ready to sacrifice for somebody. And I, I just think that the consistency of his message and his, and his character is going to go a long way. Yep. And I think what is great about this hire is he's been in the program for a while. Mm -hmm. He's gotten to see two coaches do it two different ways. Great point. You know, so he's seen a coach do it one way, be successful and, you know, get hired mm -hmm. at a bigger school. He's seen a coach, you know, have some success, but then, you know, times get rough and things go a different direction. And he's he's been able to see how what works, what doesn't work. So when you have that kind of experience in the same spot, so you're in the same place, you're in Boise, you know how to interact with the fans, you know how things go around here, you know the culture, you know all these things, that just, it helps a ton, you know, mm -hmm. him going into this gig. I love the hire. I, I mean, I, I said this about Andy Avalos too, so thank God I'm not part of the hiring process because this was a difficult job for Jeremiah Dickey. And make no mistakes, that man was on private jets with his – you know, three other search committee members going around interviewing people. Jeremiah did not want to go too far into the details of how many or who they actually did talk to in this process. He said, you know, keeping all that stuff um, exclusive, private was was very meaningful to him because a coaching search impacts a lot of people. It impacts a lot of jobs. It impacts a lot of families. And so he really wanted to do his best to keep all of that information behind closed doors. And I got to say, he did a phenomenal job of it because – I, you know, really felt like it was trending towards this direction with everything you heard um, 
especially Saturday night after the game. Like I, I didn't I didn't see how it could go another way. But up until four o'clock on Sunday, Jeremiah Dickey stood in front of the team and told everybody, and it was that moment in time where we all kind of found out together. And so the fact that they were able to keep it that close to the vest and, and not let it leak and through any sources, boosters, nothing, was really, really impressive. Now we enter a new era of football here at Boise State. Spencer Danielson is the leader. And, and to your point really quick, like eventually the, the rubber is going to meet the road with a bunch of these challenges. I feel like at the end of the Andiavolos era, he was judged off of his worst days and not his best days. And he certainly had some great days um, as a head coach, but definitely even before he was a head coach here at Boise State. Spencer Danielson is going to run into his worst days. I, you look at the schedule next year in September, it is absolutely daunting. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just completed probably, or we just witnessed what was probably the most difficult September in school history. Well, now they're gonna take a step up with schools like Oregon and Oregon State, at least for now, mm -hmm. on the schedule. Washington State's getting added to the schedule. Don't necessarily know when that game's gonna be played. They have a cross country season opener against Georgia Southern. Just kind of a sneaky game, more than anything, a sneaky location that's not gonna be something you can just take for granted. Mm -hmm. And so he will be judged on on his toughest days, you know, to come. And hopefully Boise State comes out on the right side of those games, but we will see how he has to respond. I, I do realize it's it's easier to talk about it than live it. What I guess what I mean by that is once you do kind of start to really get hit with adversity, now that he is the leader of the program, we're gonna see how he truly responds. And that's not only with the media, but within that football building, with yep. his coaches, with his players. I have confidence in him, but I, I do think that it's, it will be a different challenge that we can pretend it's not going to happen, but it is going to happen. It's a different weight on his shoulders. It will be. Like like I said, uh, probably, I think it was maybe two weeks ago, I said being a head coach and a DC at the same time, you know, it's different because now he has to manage the team, call the defense and do all these things. But now, like, as we go back to that, the focus now is you have to manage the entire team. Mm -hmm. You have to know what's going on on offense. You have to, you know, you have to make those tough decisions and those tough calls and it's a different it's a different weight that you hold on because yep. you know when you're DC and you go out and you hold in a bowl game you hold uh, UNLV to one offensive touchdown you're you did your job that's your job but when you're a head coach if we go out and we we stop them and only give up seven there but the offense is just terrible that's on you too so it's it's just a different it's a different vibe and mm -hmm. I know. He'll have, to, he'll have to adjust to this, but the good thing, like I said, is he's being able to see two different coaches, an offense and a defensive coach, go through it. I want to get into what the staff is going to look like, his vision for that, how he's going to handle that, how he's going to delegate it. But first, I just want to hear from Spencer Danielson on what it means to him to be the next head football coach here at Boise State. I focus on three things. Love Jesus, work hard, treat people right. I have it written in my office. Every day I look at those three things. I'm like, Spencer, you got to do those three. It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean we're going to win every football game we play in. But those three things, I can promise you, they will not change. That's me. That is me. And one of, my, one of our players, DJ Schramm, for my birthday, went around the room and said one thing you love about your coach. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes and said, Coach, I love you because you never change. And I promise you, speaking to our Bronco family right now, that's not changing. I'm passionate about this place. I love the people here in this place, that is who I am. That is never changing. And I can promise you this too, when you watch this team, when you watch this family play, it will not be perfect. But I promise you it will be a group of young men that play fast, they play smart, and they play together. That is a promise. And we're going to work our tail off to do that consistently. And it's going to be a program that is built on love. And love can easily be taken as all rainbows and butterflies and, oh, it's just all fun and games. That's not what I'm talking about. Love is action. Love is sacrifice all the time. If I tell you I love you, that means I'm ready to sacrifice for you. I'm ready to put my own agenda aside and I'm going to do something for you because I love you. I love this team. I love our players, our staff, this community. And that's action. That is sacrifice. The same thing those players did and will continue to do. It's because they love each other. That doesn't mean everything goes well. That doesn't mean everything's perfect. It never will be. Life's not that way. But you're going to watch a group of young men, a staff, continue to push a community that is founded on love. And that is action and that is sacrifice. 
You're going to see a team that is tough. We're going to work our tail off together. Day in and day out and doing it the right way, impacting the community. A team that is disciplined, doing the right thing, not the easy one. And once again, doing it with a smile on our face. You can work your tail off, make the hard decisions, not the easy ones, and still have a smile on your face. That is life. That's the thing I tell our players all the time is what I, coaches, teachers, influencers, I know at some point when I stand before the good Lord, I'm going to answer for everything I did, good and bad. And like it says in the Bible, to whom much is given, much is required. And I am fully aware of that. And it keeps me up at night that day when I meet our Lord and Savior and all the men that I've impacted and who I maybe didn't do it the right way. But I promise you we're going to tail off to do it the right way where it's a group of young men that love each other. They're tough. They're disciplined. And at the end of it, a group of young men that compete in everything they do. Because they're sometimes lost where, oh yeah, compete, and if you don't win, it's okay. It's not okay. Because if you lose too many times as a husband, that's not going to go well. If you lose too many times as a father, it's not going to go. You lose too many times in your job, you're going to get fired. And so the hunt to pursue, to win in everything you do, that is life. That's for everybody. But now how you do it is everything. You can do it with a smile on your face. Love who you're around. Be passionate who you're around. And that's going to fuel your fire because it cannot be about you. I can promise you this. This is not about me. It is not about me. It will never be about me. It is about us doing it together. A community a staff, a group of players, Boise State University. And I believe so strongly that Boise State University is going to be a light on a hill to this nation, to college athletics, to academics, across the board, and it needs to be. We have the people to do that. We have the people. And I believe so strongly in my soul that it is our job as coaches to create world changers in a world that desperately needs it. There's 110, 18 to 22 year old young men on this team that need to be trained up in the way they should go because at some point they're gonna be in this world and they need to change it positively. And I know for a fact that growing elite young men will always turn into elite football players, always. It's a byproduct of creating them to be men that are always working to be the best version of themselves. But I just, the biggest thing I want you all, everybody listening, to hear my heart, is I love this team. I love these players. I love this community. And I promise you, that is action. That is sacrifice. And you will have my everything in any facet, during season, out of season, whatever anybody needs, I will always get your back because I love you. And I know what that means. I know what that's going to mean for me. That does not mean things are going to always be perfect. That doesn't mean we're going to win every single game. But I do know it's going to be a group of young men that are going to do amazing things on and off the field. And we're going to work our tail off to do that together. And we are in this together. And I promise you this, the best is still to come. For me, the, when this kind of tipped the scales heavily in his favor is when I, I, I previously talked about how Jeremiah Dickey said it's a matter of if not when for Spencer Danielson. So at the press conference prior to the bowl game, I asked Spencer, how do you prove that when is now? And his answer just kind of blew me away. It was, I'm not here to prove anything. I'm not here to be somebody that I'm not. I am here to have the best interest of these players, care for them, love them, get them ready to play a football game. And whatever happens after that, I'll be okay with. And at that moment in time, I was like, man, that, that seemed powerful to me. This guy's trying to interview for the job of his life. And he does, I'm not saying he doesn't care, but like that's just not at the top of his list of priorities. I'm not here to prove anything. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm here to take care of my players. Yep. And I just thought that that was a very good response to that situation. No, yeah, I totally agree. Like I said, he was, he was trying to keep the main thing the main thing. He was focused on the goal that they set out at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. Even like you said, he could have uh, definitely flipped that around and used it more for a recruiting tool and trying to get himself in the door. But he just he kept the main thing the main thing. So you brought up coaching staff and things like this. And Spencer Danielson did say that he will obviously hire a defensive coordinator, whether that's internally or outside of the program. We're going to have to wait and kind of see how he wants to approach that. Um, 
But, you know, he's, he's going to hire a defensive coordinator. He's no longer going to be the defensive coordinator and call plays. I guess I don't know who's going to call plays. I shouldn't assume that. Uh, but I don't think he would he would call plays moving forward. And the reason why is you hear how he wants to treat his coaching staff. And for me, it seems very Coach Pete-like. You hire good people and you let them go do their thing and you fill in the gaps where you need to and you go back and you work with punt returners on special teams when you have some extra time to make sure that they know how to catch a football back there. They always said they gave Coach Pete that job to kind of just so he didn't get so bored out there. <laughs> Keep him in the loop because uh, he definitely would like to call some plays. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I, th that, I like that approach, obviously. Um, been a part of, you know, the Coach Pete era and the Brian Harson era. Two different coaches, two different coaching styles. Um, one is more micromanaged a bit with the coaches. And you can tell, obviously, how involved they are with you know, whether it's position stuff, whether it's concepts, whether it's, you know, just meetings. And then the other is, you know, just if you're going to fall on your face, I'm going to let you fall on your face. You're going to learn and we're going to learn from your own mistakes and then we'll handle it internally, you know, the problems and things like that of mm -hmm. those sorts. So uh, it's, you know, it's a lot of coaches out there, but I think everybody has their own way of doing it because there are coaches out there that micromanage a ton, but they're successful. So it's just, I guess it, Tone, tone is, is not necessarily, you know, what they're saying. It's how they're saying it. Mm -hmm. I want to comment on that. But first, I'm going to let Spencer Danison talk about how he wants to approach his coaching staff here at Boise State. We'll hire a defensive coordinator and will not be involved. And when I say that, obviously, as the head coach involved in regards to what they're doing and making sure we're doing things that promote who we are, staying true to who we are as a Boise State um, in regards to Boise State defense. But... I'm going to empower, hire the right coaches and empower them and trust them on offense, defense, and special teams. Like that is a huge goal of mine. That's why I'm, um, to Mike's question earlier, is I'm going to make sure through the process that we hire the right staff because then it's my job to empower them and then trust them with their ideas and what they want to do. Let's go do it. If it's the best thing for our players, it's the best thing to give us a strategic advantage, which we need, let's do it. But I'm going to hire the right coaches in the right seats, empower them, and then let them go do it. So he wants to delegate. You mentioned that you were part of the Brian Harson era and the Chris Peterson era, both brilliant offensive minds. It's hard to argue either of them were wrong in the way that they approached it, given the fact that they both won a lot of games at a clip that would make a lot of head coaches across the country super jealous of, of the way that they did they did things. But from my understanding, Brian was kind of more of like the, the micromanager, wanted to make sure that, you know, it was, it was they're running the ship that he, the way that he wanted it ran. And again, hard to argue it, given the results. But I bring up Chris Peterson because the message I hear from Spencer Danielson more reminds me of, of the way that he approached things. And really quick, I'm not trying to compare Spencer Danielson to Chris Peterson because that is just a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. I, I just kind of mean like what, what I hear out of this specific yeah. thing, it kind of seems a little more Coach Pete-like. Yeah, that might be a cardinal sin to ever say anything bad about Coach Pete here in <laughs> this state of Idaho. So you got to watch out there. But how did he delegate? Like – how, how involved was he and, and where was he involved when it came to game plan, the offense, things like that? Did he spend more time with the offense than he would the defense? Um, I'll say involved as far as I think game planning internally when they're doing all those installs with just the coaches, I feel like he's very involved there. But then once they break out of that and now let's say it's RP uh, installing things, he, Coach Pete's in the back of the room, you know, just kind of in the back, hanging out, not in the front, you know, being vocal about what's going on. He's allowing his coordinators to install. So if you're a player, the way you see it is, oh, RP is running everything. This is his show. Uh, and then I think when things, because obviously at one point in time, things started going a little south. I think they had, you know, talks behind closed doors because obviously – he ended up not going with Pete to Washington. So mm -hmm. you can tell that, you know, things didn't work out the way Pete necessarily wanted them at, at the end. But uh, they definitely – I think he did a good job of not allowing the players to see it because vice versa. I've seen where, you know, uh, it's been handled the opposite way where you can see where a little clash in there. You know, it was – I went through, what, three coordinators while I was there. So – very different approaches there. So 
uh, it's it's a certain way you can handle it. Obviously, like you said, both ways work because both of those coaches were very successful. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I mean, Harson came in the first year. Yes, we had pieces, but you still have to coach. Yeah, that's what people don't realize. You can have a lot of talent, but if you can't coach it, it's tough. Twelve and two, Fiesta Bowl champs, his first year in in Boise. So, was he a little more? Was he at the front or front of the room then when you know oh, those yeah. position meetings or whatever happened? Oh yeah, you could uh, definitely get some input and stuff from him during during uh, installs if we're doing it as a team and not as positions. Uh, you'd, you'll hear him come in and say, well, this is how we want to do this. This is how it should look, those mm-hmm. kind of things. It wasn't 100% always on, let's say, drink to, to um, you know, just do everything. It was always he was involved. Is there a benefit of that? Let me ask you that. Um, I mean, like we said, it's – my mom always said it's more than one way to skin a cat. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's just different approaches. Yep. I mean – and sometimes it works when you have coaches who are newer to, you know, being an OC because Drink, obviously, this is one of his first opportunities being an OC. So having Harson, who is able to jump in and help out and be open to basically saying, hey, if I don't really like how that's going, I want you to do it this way and just be vocal about it. That helped Drink, obviously, because look at Drink now. He's been successful <laughs> Everywhere he's top been. ten team in the country, right in Missouri. So he's been able. It's been he's been able to take what he learned when he just became, you know, and then you got guys like who you got guys like Mike Sanford, where Sanford and I feel like Sanford and Harson's approach was more of obviously Sanford knew what he was doing. He mm-hmm. went to three Fiesta Bowls in four years, three different schools. So uh, he that relationship, I don't feel like it was more as delegated as. Uh, or I, I don't think it was more micromanaged as the drink situation, you know. So it's just, it's real. You got to know who you can do it with, who you can't do it with. I think experience matters, all those things. So just being able to be adaptable to your coaches. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I think both those guys did a tremendous job. As you said, drink has gone on to unbelievable things, great success mm-hmm. in Missouri, in the SEC, Absolutely. top ten all team in the it. country. Uh, Mike Sanford, I feel like what what a uh, you know brilliant guy, uh, super intentional in what he does, and as you said, his his track record three Fiesta Bowls in four years at three different schools. Yeah. I would love to know if any offensive coordinator can claim that. It's yeah, that would have to be very very unique. I would I would only assume. Um, so either way, it is now Spencer Danielson's job, and they charge into the future. He's three and zero as the interim head coach with the Mountain West Conference Championship. I do want to touch on that and talk about the bowl game as well coming up because we found out Boise State's going to play in the Las Vegas Bowl. But uh, first things first, I think uh, you know after Spencer Danielson getting the head coaching gig. I think that the personnel of going in and not going into the transfer portal are the next two biggest headlines. We'll begin with the player leaving really quick, and that's Taylor Green. Uh, he comes out the day that Spencer Danielson is announced as the head coach and says that he is entering the transfer portal. Now, uh, that don't make anything out of that. It, this is something that I feel like has been brewing and has been developing uh, behind the scenes. Uh, Spencer Danielson and Taylor Green have an awesome relationship. Taylor Green and Bush Hamden have a really good relationship. And at least at the moment, all signs are pointing towards Bush returning. I still think he's going to have great opportunities out there given what he's been able to do this season. Uh, Over 30 points per game with some moving pieces. Offensive line, he's juggled a little bit, although they've been super talented. He's had Ashton Genty. He hasn't had Ashton Genty. George Halani missed a bunch of the season. His number one wide receiver goes into the transfer portal. Taylor Green, Maddox Matson rotate. There's just a lot that happened, and he still found a way to manage to consistently produce over 30 points per game for this offense. Um, um, but Taylor Green enter, enters the transfer portal. I don't think it has anything necessarily to do with his relationships with Spencer Danielson or Bush, Bush Hamden. But just overall, the way this season went, you know, I, I think that they want to go out and they want to get evaluated and, and see what else is out there. And I have pretty good sources that will tell me that Taylor had opportunities to leave Boise State last year after he had a really good redshirt freshman season. And so the, the rules are designed to let players vet this process out. And that is is just the route that Taylor's going. I know that there are fans out there that hate it. Mm-hmm. I know that there are fans out there that understand it. But I, I, I think that it, it's – if you want to compare this to football of yesteryear, you got to stop doing it because this is not football of yesteryear. It's never going to go back to that either. So you're literally wasting your time. I think yeah. the best way to approach it is the way Spencer Danielson is approaching it. He is adamant to, the, to let Taylor Green know they want him here. They think they can develop him. And they're going to continue to recruit him. 
but they're not writing him off just because he wants to go see what else is out there. Yeah. Here's where I think we stand. I think if you rewind to, let's go three and a half weeks ago. Three and a half weeks ago, Andy Avalos was the head coach. Taylor Green was the starter who threw five passes a game. He was a quarterback. He, he was not the starting <laughs> was, quarterback. He was a quarterback. He was the starter who threw five passes a game and the backup threw 20. Um, the Basically, the locker room seemed to be, you know, in a very, very low place. Uh, yeah, you have a – that week you have a receiver going to portal. Um, so all of these things three weeks ago. I think three weeks ago – Probably Taylor Green was at the lowest he's ever been since he's been here, right. right? So I think some decisions were already made, you know, with him and his family and, you know, going to see what happens. We're going to get in the portal. You fast forward three weeks, the guy that you were sharing a position with is now hurt, and it's almost fair to say that he will not be ready for the first game next year. So you basically have a position waiting on you. You're going to be the guy. You don't have to worry about splitting time. I mean, unless obviously you get beat out in the off season mm -hmm. from the younger guys, you gotta you got that. You get a new coach um, who you obviously have a great relationship with. Um, your running back, who is basically a top guy in the country, decides he's gonna stay, and he's like your best friend. Yep, your roommate, like all this. So right, all these factors from three weeks ago to now, everything has changed from when I feel like that decision was made which is why when it was announced, I feel like he had to leave, you know, that foot in the door. He didn't close it. He mm -hmm. made sure he kept his foot right there saying, there's still a possibility I might be coming back. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it was just predetermined that he was going to go. So once, obviously, the process was started, once Avalos was fired, schools are now able to reach out, right, because yep. you don't have a coach. So I think because that process was started, that's why he's in the portal. I don't think that means he's leaving, though. I really do believe there's a real chance that he could return. And I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling here because I want to read the list of schools that have already reached out to Taylor and Green. You know, the transfer portal is a funny thing because uh, there's already movement that starts to happen, it seems, before somebody actually is officially in the transfer portal, which, again, I wish there, there were NCA. You know, they're, they're not supposed to do that. It would oh, be great yeah. if the NCA actually enforced that. In this case, it was kind of inevitable, Taylor Green going into the portal. But uh, from what my sources have told me, I mean, we are talking within minutes, Shane, of, uh, of going into the portal. Cal, Arkansas, Oregon State, Miami, Baylor, and Michigan State all reached out to Taylor Green. And Cal and Arkansas – seem to be uh, the most interested, uh, if you will, in terms of targeting Taylor Green. And um, I believe they're actually even trying to schedule, you know, meetings with Taylor Green in, in the very, very near future. So Taylor, believe it or not, he's actually going to stay in Boise because we all forget throughout all this football, NIL, transfer portal, all this school is still a thing. Yeah. And so he is actually going to remain in Boise because he, he, you know, he is a student athlete. He's going to stay here and make sure that he che checks, uh, takes care of all that. And then I believe the semester wraps up on December 15th, December 16th, yeah. somewhere in that time frame. And so after that, he will then, you know, likely go kind of start to really explore his options. Um, I think he's a great kid. I think he's a great athlete. The, the, the saddest thing for me, selfishly, is in the Mountain West Conference Championship game where he won offensive MVP. <laughs> Over 200 yards passing, 90 yards rushing, uh, four total touchdowns. Man, the, it, it felt like him and Bush connected for the first time. I've talked with guys that have been in the game for a long, long time that have called plays in, in college football at a really high level. They said that the game Bush called, one of the best they've ever seen in terms of what he was able to dial up effectively. And then you talk about how Taylor went out and executed that. Man, it's the things that we've heard Bush Hamden kind of, uh, I'll say harp on, really the entire season. Taylor's footwork, impeccable. He threw from the pocket. He had accuracy. A big thing, too, vertical run game. It wasn't always side-to-side -side for Taylor. A number of his big runs, vertical run game. It all, like, finally connected, and we saw, whoa, this could be really, really special. And now we don't know if it's ever going to happen again. And at the very least, if it does, we got to be a little bit of patient to see how this plays out. Uh, I guess, you know, like we said, you get better with reps. Mm -hmm. And this might be the, mo Great the point. most reps he had all year, you know, in the past game. His success – regaining all of those all of those reps and the starting quarterback job Shane it 
it's so noticeable. You look at the numbers. His quarterback efficiency rating these last three games, you would classify as great. His quarterback efficiency rating over the first 10 games, uh, at least half of which – he doesn't know how much he's playing, how many reps he's getting, all this stuff. It was down 120-ish, which is what you would consider not good, you know? I mean, at least you would want it to be higher than that. And so we saw him really be great. Uh, efficiency, completion percentage, all of this stuff really started to come along these last three games. For whatever reason, it's almost like he didn't have to share a position anymore. <laughs> I mean, really, he had ownership. You're, you're right, man. And I think we said no that. At, I think we said that at some point in time on this podcast when it came to Taylor Green, and you see some of the stuff that he might have been struggling at. I don't think less reps were the answer. No. He's he's only a sophomore. He needs those reps. Yeah. And once he regained all of those reps, man, he started to take off once again. So we'll see. And, and folks. There's going to be real interest out there in Taylor Green. I mean, you hear stuff that's going on in the transfer portal right now. I've heard of quarterbacks that haven't had the success of Taylor Green playing in back-to-back, -back, you know, conference championship games, aren't able to break off 70-yard runs. They're getting significant offers out there. And so I can only imagine the interest that Taylor Green is going to attract in the transfer portal. And the Green family has a really important, tough decision to make. Yeah. Some of these offers, you're really going to have to – Peel apart and consider because, it, you know, it, you feel like if you return to Boise State, you got a great shot to be the guy here. And we all saw uh, during the Kellen Moore era, heck, I mean, even your, you with your era, the response, if, if you are a star on the blue, people are going to love you forever in this city. And you're going to have job offers and you're going to have connections and all of these things. If you go off to one of those bigger schools, I mean, you can be an All-American at Alabama, and people aren't going to know who you are just because they have so many freaking All-Americans, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can be a star and a hero and a legend forever in this town. And that's something you got you got to wonder, man, is the short-term payoff worth potentially sacrificing some of that for less money now? It, it, I, I don't envy the people that have to make these decisions because it is, it, it is tough. I need the kids to understand, just like the fans always say, the grass is not always greener because uh, based off – the numbers and what I've been seeing online, I think someone said there's enough kids in the portal to start a whole new mm -hmm. conference and have 14 teams. Yep. Over 1,200 kids went into the portal day one. That is – that's crazy. Some of them with realistic expectations, a huge majority of them with very unrealistic expectations. you got to also look at it like this. Do you want to go in the portal? Uh, you probably make some money, but you go somewhere and you compete against – the unknown, you know, mm -hmm. what's out there. Obviously, bigger schools probably have a little bit more competition. Yep. Or do you want to come back where, I mean, as long as you do your job in the offseason and get after it, you basically have a starting position. We talk about the quarterback uh, competition at Boise State. If Taylor Green shows up next spring and approaches every single day and performs at every single practice the way that he performed in the Mountain West Conference Championship game on Saturday, it's over. Like, he, he will be the guy. Like, it, it's over. That being said, I, man, Maddox Madsen, definitely a good option to have there. Yeah. He, he proved a ton this season. He's got to get back. He's got to get healthy. From my understanding, there is a chance that he even could kind of start to work his way back in the spring. Injuries are, are really tough to predict. We saw it with Austin Bolt. So, I think we're really kind of too far from really knowing. But we'll, we'll continue to monitor that. One guy that did decide this is the place for him that the grass is always bluer on this side, Ashton Genty. Set Bronco Nation on fire yesterday, uh, recommitting to Boise State because that's what you have to do in, in this day and age, uh, saying that he is a Bronco for life, staying at Boise State, and uh, he, as, as he said, he wants to run it back. Yeah, Christmas came early in my house. Ooh. I think I uh... – was screaming, I don't know, that Wolf of Wall Street uh, meme. You know, <laughs> I was screaming that around the house for about 15 minutes. I think my wife got tired of me saying it, but, uh, you know, excuse the language, but I, I definitely was screaming that around my house. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, definitely a very good day. Start the Heisman campaign. We suggested this weeks ago as well. Start the Heisman campaign. I really believe that something that I, I, I don't – 
it would be interesting to see if Boise State could push something like this or if it is going to have to be the, something the fans naturally push. But you have blue outs, you have black outs, you have orange outs. You need to have like an Ashton Genty out next year. Make sure that he feels that NIL love. Or even maybe it's just like an overall like a, a player out. And you just have all of their T-shirt jerseys. And hopefully for Ashton Genty, Nike actually really produces an Ashton Genty jersey because I think a ton of fans would buy that thing. And um, I – to push for that, show love towards the players. I think I haven't seen it yet. I think it would be a great idea. The players would benefit from it. The school would benefit from it. I, I, I think it would be a really cool idea. In the meantime, start the Heisman campaign for 2024 Ashton Genty today. With the way that the Heisman is getting handed around nowadays, I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't think he has a chance for the Heisman. Maybe not. But I, I, I just want the dope. Can we get the dope? Well, the doke has turned out to be a joke because they're like the only ones that haven't acknowledged the fact he's like one of the best running backs in the country. There, I bet you there's a chance. Well, well I don't know if we the, the, the complete Heisman totals. Well, no, they haven't. They haven't been released yet. We'll find that out soon. But I want to be surprised if somebody somewhere, if Ashton Genty has at least one vote from some human in America to where the doke walker wouldn't even place him in their top ten. I, that, it, it's an absolute joke to me. Um, I will continue tweeting at them to make sure that they realize it because he led all of college football, Shane, in yards from scrimmage per game by 15.7. That was the gap between him and the next best dude in America this year. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. It's pretty bad. They should have they should have honored him. They should have acknowledged him. At least acknowledged him. Should have at least acknowledged him. And they didn't do it. But Ashton Genty's back. We have heard things about NIL, and yes, he's probably going to receive, uh, you know, a, a nice package or whatever to stay here. But even what you hear there, folks, make no mistake about it. Ashton Genty, if he would have left here, he would have got two, three, four times that amount, or or whatever he's receiving at other schools. Like, I, I am so confident that it at least would have been double. But he stays at Boise State. He will be the face of the program. His I, his face better be on the side of Albertson Stadium next year. And if anything, man, it's just marketing to uh, continue to hype up your best player, and it's all going to fall back on the university as well. I think that what, whatever they pay to Ashton Genty – Oh, they're going to make it back in jersey there, sales. I, man, I agree. Like, in, in marketing, in some way, shape, oh, yeah. or form, he is a huge asset to them, not only in terms of his production now, but in terms of visibility across college football. Yeah, for sure. Every watch list next year he'll be on. Uh, I mean, you'll see him on the magazines. It's going to be it's going to be crazy. We haven't had this kind of hype, you know, for a running back coming back in a while. I, I, I don't know. If, I mean, I'm not trying to be too dramatic, but I don't know if ever. I mean, this would have been like if Jay said – at the Fiesta Bowl, you know what? I'm running it back. Forget this. I'm, I want another year in the Boise State blue and orange. Yeah, it's true. And, um, I mean, you look at social media traction, man. I feel like I'm tweeting about Kellen Moore. You, anything you put out there right now, Ashton Genty, you look down, I'm like, 600 likes? Yeah. He's, what is this about? He's that guy. I tweeted out a picture of him at the basketball game on Tuesday holding the Mountain West Conference Championship trophy. I was calling the game, so I didn't, like, really pay attention. And I open up my app afterwards, and it's kind of doing that little frozen mode, which happens when you start to get a lot of engagement on Twitter, and it's got, like, 700 likes. I'm like, this is a picture of a man that just said Ashton Genty's. I just wrote, Ashton Genty's in the house. There's a picture of him. Bronco man. Nation loves him right now, man. They can't get enough of him. I tell you what, I bet he loves it here. Even more, because mm -hmm. right now he's feeling that love. Cloud nine, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. They take care of you here for sure. He is capable of doing anything here. He, I, I do believe that. Yes, you're right, Shane. It's going to be incredibly tough to win a Heisman at, at Boise State. I mean, if Kellen Moore couldn't do it, I don't know who can. He's that Boise State's going to have to be perfect, which means they're going to have to pull off a, you know a few upsets mm -hmm. early in the season next year. He's going to have to stay healthy and be the dude that we know that he can be when he is healthy. I, I, like. It's all going to have to align, but if anybody can make it align, it's Ashton Genty. What we've seen him do on a football field, superhuman. I, I, he's made some of the best plays that I have ever seen out of a Boise State football player. I mean, even his final run in the Mountain West Conference Championship game, it seems like it's just going to be this short little carry that gets him in position to maybe move the sticks. Somehow he breaks it off for 50-plus yards, and you look down at the stat sheet, and he winds up with over 150 yards rushing. And Shane, I went on a, I, I'm, I went on a uh, Las Vegas radio show last week. I kept my receipts for this, too. Uh, the over-under for Vegas for Ashton Genty rushing yards was 79.5. And I was like, 
that's just ridiculous. And the guys on the radio show are like, well, I don't know. UNLV has been pretty good against the run this year. Like, why is that so ridiculous? I'm like, you haven't seen Ashton Genty. And they're like, no, we've faced good running backs. You haven't faced Ashton Genty. You owe me some money because uh, I would have definitely threw some. <laughs> 79 yards. Yeah. That is big difference right there. Yeah. So he, he almost doubles it. Yeah. And, I mean, really, almost doubles it. And on top of that, I said Boise State was going to rush for 275 last week. I, I was a little off, man. I was a little off. They went for 301. I almost said 300, and I was like, God, that is a lot. And I'm like, but I'm confident <laughs> 275. I should have gone a little bit higher. 301, kept the receipts. Uh, UNLV could not contain Boise State's offensive line or the best running back in all of college football. So the Broncos now, Mountain West Conference championships. They uh, champions, they do the unthinkable by rallying somehow. And then in the championship game, man, like we all said, that we felt like if this happened, it was going to be a blowout. And it was yep. a blowout. Rebels didn't have a chance. We said if they can't stop the run, they will not win this game. And they could not stop the run. Mm -mm. Just had our way. That's the way we've been – we knew we can play this way, though. That's the thing. We just didn't know how good they were. It reminded me a little bit of the of the Fiesta Bowl where, um, and hear me out here for a second, all of the stars had their moment in that game, right? Tanner Vallejo, Thomas Spurbeck, Kamale Correa, Jay Ajay, Grant Hedrick. Like, all, all of you guys had, like, your, just, like, your moment where you're like, I remember that play, I remember that play. Big moment, big catch. And in the Mountain West Conference Championship game, uh, Alexander Tubner everywhere on defense. Andrew Simpson, uh, interception with that clubbed ham, a hand. Ashton Genty, big run after big run. Um, Austin Bolt, the next kind of up-and-coming star for the Boise State offense. Big touchdown catch. Taylor Green, play after play after play. He had his big moments. And it's just kind of like you look around and you're like, man, there are kind of some stars that are starting to shine here on this Boise State football team. And you look at the Rock and you're like, oh, man, all of them can come back next year too. And if Taylor does decide he wants to come back, man, there, there's just – the QB room will be will be loaded with him and Maddox in there. Um, I know that C.J. Tiller still got to develop, still got to come along. Colt Fulton, he can, he can run the offense, hasn't had a lot of opportunities to run the offense. The bowl game is going to be interesting, man. They're, they're facing a UCLA team that has been really stout on defense for most of the year. They're losing guys. I mean, they've lost a lot more guys to the portal than Boise State has, including their starting quarterback, one of their key defenders, I know key offensive linemen. And uh, so they're going to be down some bodies too, but they're UCLA. It's Chip Kelly. They've been so good on defense. I figure they're going to find a way to, to solve this thing, especially if, if you're running out of quarterback. Colt Fulton or C.J. Tiller haven't even thrown a pass in a game. Colt, I, I guess if you want to throw the two-point conversion out there, technically that doesn't count on your passing stats because it's the point after attempt, but – I guess he's thrown one scoring play in his yeah. career, but that's just going to be very, very different. Yeah, I, I'm i really interested to see the Ashton Genty line here this week uh, coming up because I'm still stuck on the 79 from last All right. week. I know. <laughs> yeah, I, wanna, I would like to know what that is. But um, UCLA, yeah, I mean, they get athletes. So mm -hmm. it's not going to be a walk in the park. Like you said, if we don't have a quarterback you know, who's thrown a pass – uh, their game plan will definitely be a little different. They're going to definitely come in with two game plans, expecting Taylor to play or one of our backups. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be a definitely a very run heavy offense coming up here this week. I would only assume so. We don't know if it's George Halani's final game. It could be potentially as a Boise State football player. We know Ashton's coming back. Breezy's coming along. You feel unbelievable about just rolling out that offensive line and getting behind them and and mm -hmm. and uh, you know denting the line of scrimmage behind Garrett Kerr and Cade Bearsford, Mason Randolph, uh, Ben Dooley, the, the freshman Cage Casey. Uh, that, that is an outstanding offensive line. Some of those guys just haven't gotten their due. And uh, it's, it's also time to begin the hype train for a guy like Mason Randolph. Kid's incredibly athletic, incredibly talented. With him coming back to at the center of that offensive line next year, uh, I know they got to replace a couple of guys. I have really, really high hopes with him in the middle of that offensive line. This – Man, today's show absolutely flew by. So much to talk about. Um, we get to do this again before the bowl game, so we will kind of go more into that actual matchup next week. But uh, Spencer Danielson, the head coach, Taylor Green in the portal, Ashton Genty staying, Mountain West Conference champs, UCLA on deck for the Broncos in the Las Vegas Bowl. It's been a fun show. Yes, it has.
Shane, appreciate it as always. This is Jay's Sports Bar serving the Idaho sports community. I'm going to send you away with some of the sights and the sounds of on-field celebrations at Allegiant Stadium following Boise State's 44-20 victory in the Mountain West Conference Championship game over UNLV. We will see you next week, everybody. The best kicker in school history, a Mountain West Conference champion for the first time in your career. How does it feel, Jonah? Oh, it feels amazing. You know, this is a goal that we work for day in and day out. Uh, so it's just all trust in the teammates, all trust in the process, and I'm glad we were able to get it done tonight. How good does it feel just to step back finally and, and relax for a moment, enjoy enjoy the fruits of your guys' labor? Gosh, yeah, it's amazing. You know, we worked so hard, we've come so far. Uh, a lot of time and attention dedicated into our craft, and, and tonight we saw our brand of football and we're Mount West champions, baby. You've been here for quite a while. Been to, since 2019, since you guys have gotten this done. How good does it feel? It feels great. It's just, uh, you know, that dead period without a championship for, for those years was definitely a place I was hurting my heart, and uh, it feels amazing to get that, that trophy back to Boise, Idaho. Jalen Clark, uh, what do you got here, man? How, how good does this feel to, to finally have in your, your possession? It's definitely been a while. I ain't got one yet, but at the end of the day, one thing they can't take away from us in this brotherhood is that we're champions, and we're going to go back, we're going to go celebrate. I heard you talking to Cotton Noe Canillo just a moment ago. You guys committed to Boise State quite a while ago. It's your first chance getting to experiencing this. How long have you waited for this moment? Like you said, three years strong. Three years strong going through COVID, different um, coaching exchanges, but at the end of the day, staying together and sticking with Coach D, and great things can happen.